Ready to mount the tree? No, sir. Ready to mount four? Sir, question 15. Which statement was about the laws of the motion is correct? Uh, the correct response for this one is that uh, A, with the first of all, is from Newton's second law. And the other correct option that could have been, which is not given in this option choice, is that the conservation of Linear momentum is derived from Newton's third law of motion. I'm going to show you the proof for this one so that I can convince you of this fact, so that you can see what is what is it that I'm talking about. The first law actually tells us is that if resultant force on any object is zero, then final velocity equals to initial velocity. This is the most concise expression of Newton's first law for any object. Second law tells us this, that the rate of change of uh, momentum of any object is directly proportional to the resultant force applied on the object, which ultimately leads to, to the definition of one moment, one Newton force, we get F equals to MA. So we're gonna try to get this logic out of this equation. This F over here basically represents the resultant force. So in other words, I could actually put the resultant sign over here, which basically means that the resultant force equals to mass times acceleration. Now, if I apply the if logic part in this equation, so if resultant force is zero, let's say if zero equals to MA, that basically means that either of these two variables, mass or acceleration has to be zero. Mass of an object cannot be zero, which leads to acceleration to be only zero. That would mean that V minus U divided by T should be zero cost multiplication gives us V minus U equals to zero. Ultimately we get V equals to U. Might as well put the vector signs over here. So if we apply the first law's inherent if part within the second law, the output part automatically comes out. That's how we can say that the first law can be derived from the second law, which makes A the correct option. And the other thing Which that I just told you is that uh, that we have already seen that the idea of conservation of linear momentum essentially follows from Newton's third law of motion f1 equals to minus f2. So it is an option and I, but it is a correct answer. Sir, what Anything from page number five? Uh, could you solve number 19? So trilinear curve. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about question number 19 because it gives us a range of variations. So you need to have a little bit of visual uh, input for solving this problem. Let's have a look at this problem and try to understand. The question says forces three Newton, four Newton and five Newton act at one point on an object. The angle at which the forces can act vary. What is the value of the minimum resultant force of these forces? Now, the minimum resultant force of any multiple vectors should be logically be zero. The minimum that could possibly get because you cannot get negative force. Well, we can consider the duration of the vector forces. So numerically, it cannot be lower than zero if you are considering for magnitude. Now, in what cases is that possible? Try to understand. 
one of the key logics that we have stated earlier, let's say if we have an object right over here and if we have multiple forces, there's a three forces working on this object in three different directions. They don't have to be working at 120 degree. I'm not saying that these angles are 120 degree. They, are, they can be any random angles. Let's say there is F1, F2, and F3. This basically means if the object is in equilibrium, this means the resultant force is zero, which ultimately leads to that the vector force one, vector force two, plus vector force three, the vector sum of all of these three things should give us zero. Ultimately goes on to prove that if we draw up a vector diagram with all of these three forces, we should get a closed triangle. So which means if I draw up these three forces with appropriate scale and appropriate direction, let's say F1 in this direction, F2 goes this way, and then F3 comes a little bit this way. If drawn appropriate with appropriate scale and direction, F1, F2 and F3 should give us a perfectly closed triangle. So this is actually one of the basic logic that you have to understand that whenever we have a three force cases, it's important that the magnitude of these three forces should be such that when drawn using an appropriate scale, these three forces should be able to produce a triangle, at least a triangle. <clears throat> I'm using the word at least because there's a reason behind it. Have a look. As per this question, if I just give values to this force, let's say this is 3 Newton, this is 4 Newton, and let's say this is 5 Newton. If I assume this force is in this manner, uh, this figure is not drawn to scale, but what I'm trying to show you is that let's say F1, 3 Newton, F2 is 4 Newton, or F3 is 5 Newton. If, it's, if that is the case, whenever you're going to draw up a closed triangle with these three forces, you're going to come up with a triangle which can be in any orientation. I mean, the angle can vary. You can have any orientation for the far all I care, but the ratio of these three sides is going to be three is to four is to five. If we just consider a very simple idea that is it possible to produce a triangle with these three lengths? That answer is yes. Because on the key requirement for three lengths of side to be able to make a triangle is that the sum of the smallest two sides should be bigger in length compared to the biggest side of the triangle. So if you have three arms, let's say X, Y, and Z, and for it to be a uh, triangle, to be honest, uh, the actual uh, uh, geometry logic tells us that sum of any two sides should be bigger than the third. So X plus Y should be bigger than Z, Y plus Z should be bigger than X, and Z plus X should be bigger than Y. If we have that logic fulfilled, only then we can get a triangle out of three different lengths. If that is not the case, then we're not going to get a close triangle. Let me give you an example. If you, if you have three lengths, let's say one is two, another one is three, another one is five, you cannot make a triangle out of this. But it is possible that if these three things were forces, two Newton, three Newton, five Newton, the result of these three, these, these three forces could be zero. How? Let's say you apply two Newton in this direction, you apply three Newton in the same direction, and five Newton exit in the opposite direction, you could possibly get zero Newton, zero force. And if we try to draw up a vector diagram of this scenario, which is basically the marginal case, that vector diagram might as well look like this. Let's say two Newton over here in this direction. From this point, we could draw up three Newton over here in this direction. And from this point, we could drop the five Newton all the way up to the same starting point right over here. So let's say two Newton finishes over here. So let's say two Newton over in this direction, three Newton in the same direction, and five Newton working in the exact opposite direction you could still get, come back to the same starting point, ultimately giving you not a triangle, but a resultant force zero. But if that is not the case, if it so happens that you have, you're dealing with three different forces or three different sides of a triangle, where the sum of the smaller two sides is bigger, is smaller than the third side, you cannot get a triangle out of that. For example, if, we ha if you ever work with forces like, let's say one Newton, two Newton and four Newton, these three things, these two three forces working on an object can never give you zero resultant force. The smallest you could have is one Newton. That is the case when smaller of the two forces, smaller of the three forces, one Newton and two Newton, they work in one direction, producing a total result of three Newton and four Newton works exactly in the opposite direction so that altogether you get a value that is exactly one Newton. If you wonder, why should it work in the exact opposite direction? Why cannot it work at the same, same angle? The idea is very simple, have a look. If you consider the way a vector diagram works, is that, let me draw up a parallelogram rule so that it might make better sense with you. 
Should I draw up a parallelogram rule or should I draw a triangle rule? Let me see if I can find out. An... <sighs> and it's not called animation. What is it called? Sir, simulation. Simulation. Simulation, yes. Of physics, sir. Simulation of. Sir, you should learn animation in PowerPoint, sir. Sir, you even have open shot video editor. You can also use that. Yeah. Okay, so we have the first vector which looks like this. So let's say this is our first vector working on an object and let's say this is our second vector working on this object. And whether we should have a third vector that is equal or not, we can define it by a third vector like this. Now, uh, one of the important bits that you need to understand that for the three forces to produce zero resultant, we need to have why can't I move this thing? Okay. The idea is to place it in this point and then move it like that. Okay. In this scenario, we can get a zero resultant scenario. If the B force, force B, works at a bit steeper angle, for example, let's say if force B was working right over here of the same magnitude, let's say it was working over here, then the third force could have been a bit smaller in size that could be possible. The steeper the angle becomes, for example, if I try to rotate it in a circular orientation like that, the close this vertex comes to the starting point of a vector, the smaller the C side has to be to be ultimately make the whole object to reach into equilibrium. And if it so happens that two forces out of the three are perfectly equal and opposite to each other, you can very well consider that this C force doesn't have to exist anymore. It will, it will essentially become zero. Or in the other case, if you have a scenario where two of the forces work in the exact same direction, in that case, if you want to have a zero resultant by using the third force, it has to be so that the third force must be exactly equal and opposite to the vector sum of those two things. Whenever a scenario, you have a situation like this, a plus b equals to minus c, which basically means a plus b plus c equals to zero. So the point that I'm trying to get at is that you can get the minimum result. For example, if in any case, the sum of a and b is smaller than c itself in that case obviously you're going to have this much as your resultant so the sum of any of the two forces should be bigger compared to the third force if the total resultant has to be zero if that is not the case if that is not the case in that case the resultant force will always be the biggest minus sum of the two smaller. And that is that that is going to work out. This is for the smallest resultant force. I'm definitely going to write smallest. This is not the only resultant scenario. This is the smallest resultant case. Uh, because this would mean that two of the small forces are working in one direction, exactly opposite of the biggest force. And because the biggest force is working the other way around, if you do the subtraction of those things, you get the resultant force. And uh, that's for the smallest discussion. The biggest force that you can get out of any four number of forces is always their vector addition. Because if you want to get the biggest force out of the application of multiple forces, it's obvious that all of those forces have to work in that exact same direction. So that's actually not a very difficult problem. So for this question that we have over here, the correct answer would be zero. Because the question says, what is the value of the minimum resultant force of these forces? You do understand that three, four, five can give us a closed triangle. So that answer would be zero. If we had values like, let's say two, three, six, that would be, answer would have been one Newton. If we had values like, let's say 10, 11, 12, it can still be zero because some of the smaller two is bigger than the third one. Questions? Over here, are we actually talking about a triangle or probably any polygon? For three forces, we can use the term triangle, but for any polygon, 
Uh, if we have, uh, if we are dealing with forces that are, those are more than two, then you cannot apply this logic. Uh, this logic that I just discussed exclusively works for a triangle or, or a three case scenario, three force scenario. I mean, sir, we already have the three forces then out, out of one, which of one of these should there be a resultant force? They can produce a resultant force, but if they are not, uh, if they, I mean, they can definitely produce a resultant force. I mean, for all I care, if they are not uh, producing equilibrium on the object, you can have multiple forces, three forces working on an object in such a way that the resultant is actually, there is a certain direction for that. For example, if I just want to draw this, try to think about it, we have an object like this. It's the three forces are working in this manner. You have three different values over here. You can never expect this, the result of these two forces to be zero. For the three forces to produce equilibrium, they have to work somehow balance each other out. That's where you can get a resultant a zero or equilibrium situation. The question over here that is asking us that uh, whether it is possible to get uh, zero or not. That's what I'm trying to uh, discuss over. I don't know whether it should be zero or not, but how can you check whether you can have zero resultant or not? That's the point that I try to describe. I mean, it can be like one of these three force or an extra a force out of this, I mean, in outside mentioned over here, I mean, in the question, sir. The resultant? Yes, sir. Are you asking for the minimum resultant or the maximum resultant? I mean, sir, I'm thinking this like a triangle. Like if we are, are we are already given with three forces and we can actually make entire triangle with these three forces, then the resultant force are, do they have to be one of the, like scale the one of these forces to make, make the resultant or like, we just brought another force to be called the resultant. So, what will be the exact resultant of these three forces? Practically, depends exactly what are the alignments of these three forces because they are vector quantities. In this case, question that says that the, the angles of these three forces can act, forces act can vary, which means we have the privilege to consider the forces could act in any direction. Because of that, we need to judge a situation that whether it is possible for us to achieve equilibrium or not. Could we get equilibrium or not? I mean, is there a likely case where we can get equilibrium or not? That's what I'm trying to get at. Because if you if you do get an equilibrium, the resultant force would be zero Newton. If you do not get an equilibrium, the resultant force would be bigger than zero Newton. So zero Newton could be a possible lower value of an resultant force. That's why I, am, I was trying to judge that first, which for this question was satisfied. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Bucho. Yes, sir. Yes, Hassan, go ahead. Sir, I'm not just the actor object M, uh, 5 Newton, 4 Newton, and 3 Newton left D. That will just be minus 11 Newton to the left. First, a minimum of it. It's just acting on the left direction, you know? Yeah, in this case, minimum would, uh, minimum, the word minimum actually is meaning that minimum by magnitude. Because that minus sign would not would actually mean uh, opposite directional force, which has a pretty large value. So we are not going to call it minimum. We're going to say opposite force with a pretty large value. Yes, sir. Sir, in that case, that would be a maximum force, right, sir? Well, if all the forces are working in the same alignment, we will definitely call the resultant a maximum force, yes. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Sure. <clears throat> Any further question, anyone? Nope. I'll help you understand that. No big deal. I mean, if you can take to that, I don't want to, okay? Uh, so to make 23 any mechanics, uh, huh? I have 23 problems. To math and mechanics, problem come across course already. Uh, Kolo Halo, or Nakolo I mean, I can use the other I'm either an force distribution to give a So I'm making this figure pretty large. I might as well just to zoom in a little bit. Have a look. The question says that let's see the read the question a car of mass m travels at a constant speed. Important information. Constant speed, very important information. A car of mass M travels at constant speed up a slope at an angle of theta to the horizontal as shown in the diagram. Resistance and the friction provide a resistive force of F, which is working along the slope backwards. <clears throat> what force is needed to propel the car at this constant speed? So to propel the car at this constant speed, we have to produce exactly equal amount of backward force as uh, that is currently working on the object or the car. 
the question already here has given us one of the backward force, which is F. The other part should come from the weight component because the car is going up, uh, up along a and an, along an inclined plane. <clears throat> so, uh, how can we work around that? How can we how can we work for that? Now, let me show you. Let's say this is a car. The weight of the car is working vertically downwards. This is the weight working line W. <clears throat> and we need to find out the components of this weight that works along the plane and vertical to the plane. So I'm going to just draw up a normal line over here that is normal to the surface. And by the concept of uh, corresponding angles, I can say that this angle should also be theta. Now, for those who cannot see that why this angle should be theta, I'm going to show you a little bit of geometry over here. Have a look. <clears throat> you should see that. Uh, so let me just drop this waiter a bit longer. You should see that within this triangle, uh, within this triangle, this is 90 degree. I mean, this is a 90 degree. So this angle is supposed to be 90 minus theta because the sum of all the three angles of the triangle makes 90 uh, 180 degree. And within this vertical, sided angle which exists right over here have a look over here for this within this triangle this angle is 90 minus theta this angle is 90 exactly so obviously this is supposed to be 180 minus 90 plus 90 minus theta you ultimately get theta so this angle that the weight makes with the vertical uh, on the road is still 90 degree this is still theta so if we use this for if we use this angle to divide up the weight component to two vertical components over along this case, we're gonna have the perpendicular component, which is the non-adjacent, and along this alignment, we're gonna have the adjacent component. So this is gonna be our W cos theta component, which is gonna be balanced by the reaction force of the of the slope. And along this alignment, we're gonna have W sine theta, which is gonna be the perpendicular component. So the total resistive force or total is not total resistive, I'm gonna say total backward force is actually the sum of these two, F plus W sine theta. So to move the car or to propel the car forward at constant speed, we have to produce that exact amount of force out of the engine or the friction force of the tires, which basically gives you Mg sine theta plus F. I think this is the correct response. <clears throat> Sir, W cos theta and W sin theta, you can do which of them, sir? Yeah, you have a vector uh, that is working this way, which is W. There is a reference line that works like this. There is an angle theta. So the adjacent component of W that is going along the theta, uh, uh, adjacent to the theta angle, this is always W cos theta. And the one that works perpendicular to that alignment, that is always W sin theta. This is very much similar to other cases that we have seen. And only this is a little bit inverted. For example, if we have a vector like this, where the angle with the horizontal is theta, we always go by, let's say, this, this is P. Uh, this is going to be P cos theta component, and this is going to be P sine theta component, right? Yes, sir. So this is the same thing, but inverted. Okay. The easier way to go for it is that whatever the vector that you are trying to divide, theta will be always attached to that vector, and then on one side of the, uh, one side of, on one side of this vector quantity, you are going to have the theta angle. So, the reference line that is adjacent with the theta angle is always going to be a cosine component, and the other part, which is the perpendicular on that uh, theta side, will always be a sine component. This always works better or easier. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For example, there can be uh, uh, other questions that might show up that, uh, let's say this car was uh, is not working on its own. Let's say there was a towing tar truck that was used to lift up this car by a certain thing. They could ask you what would be the tension in this cable. And then, 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 and then let's say if they go ahead and say that uh, if the total setup of the towing truck and this uh, non-driving car they are accelerating uphill at a certain acceleration. What should be the tension? Which should be slightly bigger than the backward force, because in that case you are going to require some resultant force uh, to cause the acceleration of the car. So this question can actually come with a lot of different 
uh, tails attached to it and different type of variation of calculation might lead beyond that point. But the basic division of the forces always work this way, depending upon the angle theta, and which is always a good thing. Tomorrow, can we banking angle mechanism the high silam? How does the banking on the road works? No, sir. Banking money. The banking the high. Tomorrow, can banking the high? No, sir. Sir, thakte pare sir. Bike cycle driving, circular motion. Na tomorrow the banking lag bana. A to the gear lag be. <clears throat> I mean, figures like this for those who are interested. I just recall this and then I remember that you don't need this. Sir, open a sir simulation open a car attack, a vector force diagnosis. Sir, what is the like? Situations like this that whenever the, uh, there are turns, uh, the roads are usually tilted a bit above the horizontal on the outer curve. Why is it necessary or do we at, at all need this thing? You might have seen this on uh, speed tracks or more commonly seen in the NASCAR driving races. Uh, why do we need that or what's the implication or how much angle should be there? <clears throat> so these are the some of the discussion over that. And it said it also works. Uh, similar discussion can also lead to this discussion as well. Leaning on a bicycle. figures that looks like this for example why do we have to make some angle <clears throat> whenever we are trying to take a bit of a turn for stuff that you see most commonly more commonly in the motorcycle races or gt races motor gp races f1 races it is on the like banana it to the like i mean just uh hard come attached to you know both them nothing to worry about you don't need this but if you're interested you can look up some uh some stuff and if you are interested to discuss about that, ask me questions in the messenger window personally, not on the messenger group channel. So don't take everyone else's pull off. Ask me and I might actually help you understand that. So that's that. And then comes the question number 25, which is a very much similar question that here is the tension T over here. So just take it out. It's gonna show this, which is a very much similar uh, implication of this question. The question tells us that a pendulum bob is held stationary by horizontal force H. The three forces acting on the bob are shown in the diagram. We have a tension of the string. We have a horizontal force pulled to the twin towards the right. W is working vertically downwards. The tension in the string is in the pendulum is T. The weight of the pendulum bob is W. Which statement is correct? It's pretty simple. T is working this way. So if I try to divide the component uh, of the T force, tension forces over here, let's say I'm going to drop a vertical line right over here. If you wonder why am I drawing a vertical line? Because I can see over here that all the angles which are given over here are in terms of 30 degree. So if I want to bring the 30 degree within my calculation, I better divide my T force using a 30 degree angle, which I can get whenever I drop this vertical angle, I can use alternate angles. Try to understand my point. The reason I'm drawing this vertical line over here because all of my answers were given in 30 degrees. It could, it could very well be possible that they might have given all my answers using 60 degrees. Shit possible, Shilo. Had they done that, if they had done that in the question, then I would prefer to draw my reference line along this, along the horizontal, so that this angle over here, along which I'm gonna divide my T and tension force, that's, uh, I'm gonna have 60 degree in my uh, division process. So have a bit of a uh, foresight and try to see the angle that you're gonna deal with. To be honest, if you get some value in 60 degree, you can very much convert them into 30 degree. Uh, you know the procedure, how the angle conversion for all sign 10 cause those trigonometry ratio works. That's perfectly okay. You can do the reconversion, but it's a good thing that if you have this uh, insight first and then go ahead for your working. So I'm not gonna do, do, go, go ahead and do it for the 60 degree because none of my answer choices include 60 degree. So I'm gonna just get rid of this drawing altogether. And we have this thing over here. So I'm going to just write 30 degree over here. So tension is working this way. The adjacent component is going to be T cos 30. And then the perpendicular component is going to be T sin 30. As, and you can very well see that there are only, uh, the other two forces are exclusively horizontal and vertical. So this essentially means these two forces should balance each other out perfectly. 
and these two forces should balance each other out perfectly. So W equals to T cos 30 is a true information. H equals to T sin 30 is also true information. Figure out from the option choices, which one is the correct response. I think C is the correct response over here. None of that makes sense. Mm. I mean, W equals to T cos 30, sir. How do we, I mean, align W to get T cos 30, sir? Because uh, this line that I drew over here was a perfectly vertical line, which was parallel to this dotted line. That's why I could use the term uh, idea of alternate angles, where this dotted line and this dotted line are parallel to each other. This tension T line is working as the transversal between them so that I can use the idea of alternate angles and get 30 degree right over here which basically means T cos 30 is working perfectly vertically upwards and W is, is working perfectly vertically downwards. These are two vertical forces working in the scenario. So they have to balance each other out. Thank you, sir. And sir, what would have been the value of the force H, sir? Uh, the opposite one. H is working horizontally, vertically, horizontally to the right. T sin 30 component is working to the left. So these two should balance each other out. So that this is one of the current current force equation. The other force current force equation could have been also H equals to T sine 30. And just in case, if you want to bring about the relation between W and H, uh, if we just divide these two, I could also write H divided by W equals to 10 30. So if we wrote, if, if the question had another equation that that looked like this H equals to W 10 30, that would have been also a current expression uh, acceptable formula. Uh, or expected a mathematical equation, which was not given in this question, but any of these three equations, this one, this one, or this one, all three of them are equally applicable. I just wanted to show you this uh, additional part because I wanted to appreciate that it's also possible from this diagram to relate W and H. Don't feel that because these two are only horizontal vertical forces, they are not related to each other. Yes, by mechanics, they're not related to each other, but mathematically, we can make a mathematical relationship with respect to each other. That's also possible. If I the calculation, like you say, everyone, yes, sir. Hassan Matsuna Hadura, you got your question answered, right? G, sir. Sir, I'm going to ask you a question, but for a clear year, you sir. If it makes sense, we are good. No big deal. All right. Okay. I'm going to go for 29. 29 is always a very hard question. A hinge door is closed in the horizontal position uh, by a cable. Three forces act on the door. The weight W of the door, tension T in the cable, the force H at the hinge, which list gives the three forces an increasing order of magnitude. Try to understand. This is the keyword, increasing order of magnitude, which means we need to have the smallest one on the left. Slowly, we have to write the bigger one on the right side. So very small on the first, slowly increasing in value. There are multiple different ways we can attend this problem. One of the simple ways to come up with a solution for this problem is to try to draw a, a, try to draw a vector triangle to have a idea of comparison. Now you might wonder that we don't have the numbers over here. How could we possibly draw the vector triangle? We don't have the numbers, but we have the alignment. So we might not be drawing a, an actual length-based correct figure, but we can very much draw a proportional proportional triangle, uh, triangle, proportional triangle in this case, I mean, a similar triangle, which might be smaller or bigger than what we want to draw, but the ratios of the three sides can be made same because we have the angles available to us. Let me show you what I mean over here. The question says that a hinge door is held closed in the horizontal position by a cable. So this is sort of like uh, one of the doors in your, uh, canteen that you have to lift it up and then you have to enter the thing or shop or so someplace and then you, then the door automatically goes down and it is supported by this thing or uh, in some merry-go-ride, these kind of situations. This is not essentially showing us to be uh, 
uh, to be a regular door and obviously this force was w somehow this got omitted from the figure i don't know why okay or w got at the bottom why is w not a part of this picture anyway so w should be here so when i am saying that we can try to draw a proportional figure this is what i mean have a look at the alignments of all of these forces and you can try and draw a proportional figure right over here if you want or you can draw it over here if you are if you have enough space you can draw at the bottom as well so i'm gonna do draw a horizontal line right over here of any length i'm gonna draw it pretty small because i just want to take a comparison of these forces and then i'm going i, I don't have any any idea in my head that how long this force needs to be i just i'm drawing a vertical line i'm just keeping the alignment same might as well give a vertical a down arrow no big deal then i'm going to put my ruler along this cable like this and try to slide it to the right as best as i can while keeping horizontal or while keeping parallel so and get get it to the side like that so align your angle of the t and move it to the right try your best to keep it a parallel side which is going to give you let's say a force that looks somewhat like this i don't know how big this force is going to be so i'm going to draw it pretty large because i don't know how big this should be so this is going to be my t and then the h in the same procedure hold up your ruler against this force and try to move it as best as you can parallel with this line and try to match it with one of the side one of the end point of your figure whatever whatever which one whichever you feel comfortable for example for example in this case if i if i align this right uh, upper edge of the ruler right over here i have to fill up the w force a little bit so i have to redraw it a little bit on the other hand if i align it with the w force let's say right over here i might have to erase the t force a little bit so it's your choice what you want to do no big deal uh, you can do either way so let's say i'm going to hold it over here and complete the force from here in this direction so i'm keeping the alignments true that's the important bit this question can be done in other ways as well but this is one of the easiest way that i personally feel is possible to work around work around so let's say i'm going to draw this force right in this manner in which case this is going to be my h force and i just have to increase that w a little bit because that's how the force dictate now what this force essentially what this triangle essentially shows you that if you had the numerical values of these forces your actual triangle would look exactly the same only if you apply appropriate ratios this triangle can i select this triangle exclusively I hope i can this is gonna be either somewhat bigger i cannot make it bigger i cannot make it bigger i wish i could make it bigger so proportionally this same similar triangle would have become bigger or smaller if you apply appropriate scale to it but that's exactly how your figure should look like so we have a similar triangle for the actual scenario and if you just now compare for the lengths of these things you would very well see that w has the smallest of the size t has the biggest of the size and h has the medium of the size you would be very well you would have basic visual representation showing you the lengths or if you are not sure that which one is big or small just take a measurement out of your ruler and compare this lens in actual measurement in terms of centimeters or millimeter fractions that which is big or which is small and that gives you a perfect idea for the increasing order uh, sequence for these three forces which is going to be in this case wht so c is the correct response bolo yusuf sir uh is it like always that the forces the lens of the forces will be drawn at least somewhat like their magnitude or it can the push push hello hey i'm doing what i'm doing this or will it be like they can just uh in the question refer they can be of any length and not anything like that at mag and their length has nothing to do with the magnitude well to draw a true, true vector diagram we would always require their alignments and values as well if we do have their values and alignments both we can draw the diagram perfectly but if we have their lengths only but not the alignments we cannot draw a vector diagram period we can draw 
a multiple possible variations of the uh, of the forces but we cannot draw a two vector diagram if we have only the alignments we can draw up a scale figure of the possible vector diagram so we can draw up a ratio based figure i mean the diagram that i've drawn over here uh, might as well be the current figure for example if you wonder let's say if w this w force is considered to be x let's say this t is about let's say 3.5x i don't know how big is this and let's say this is 2.5x so i'm just showing you a possible ratio that the ratio of w is to h is to t uh, i'm trying to show you is going to be 1 is to 2.5 is to 3.5 so this ratio can be maintained in your angle based diagram no matter what if you keep your alignments true you're going to get the same ratio based triangle so your bigger side will always represent to be bigger side smaller side will always represent to be smaller side and vice versa Does that answer your question? I mean, will we have skins like this like all the time, sir? Oh, this is one of the MCQs that showed up in your uh, CA exam. So if you are asking me that, can we choose not to learn this? I'm going to say no. If you ask me, is this, the, is this a very common type of question? I'm also going to say no. No, this is not very common. But it's important that you know the mechanics of it. OK, sir. Thanks, sir. No problem. Angelica, why are you asking something? Did I just see your microphone go off for a second? No, sir. Achoo, I'm sorry. Feel free to ask any question if you have any. And then, sir. yeah, yes. It's a problem, she's at 42 to see. Okay, let's sorry, go sorry. to 42. I did discuss number 36. I remember very clearly I discussed 36. Yes, sir. Yes. 40 is also a very similar problem. Could you solve for number 40 using the idea of the tensions and everything? Yes, sir. It's a half of it. Exactly. Adiga T, Adiga T. So, Adiga T cos theta, Adiga T cos theta, which are going to cancel each other out. Our Uber Adiga is 2T sine theta, the sum of the two particle components of the two tensional forces. So, W is going to be equal to 2T sine theta. Or t goes to w divided by two sine two sine theta. So I think b is the correct response here. Yes. Forty two is a pretty nice question. We're gonna go for it. Have a look at question number forty two. This is a pretty interesting one, and you just need to understand what is happening over here. A mass of two point zero kg rests on a frictionless surface. Important information. Let's mark this out. Frictionless surface. It is attached to a one kg mass by a light thin string which passes over a frictionless pulley. The one kg mass is released and it accelerates downwards. What is the speed of the two kg mass? As the one kg mass hits the floor, having fallen a distance of 0.50 meter. Okay. This question can be approached by two different ways, both of which can be applicable for this question because there's no collision or there's no loss of energy. We can try to solve this problem in terms of energy conversion, or we can also try to solve this problem in terms of forces. I'm going to show you in both of these ways. Uh, you can choose either one, but one thing that you need to understand, this is a situation where this two kg mass and this one kg object, they're producing a connected body system. They are connected using this string that we have over here. Whenever we're going to let go of this one kg mass, is going to start falling downwards and this 2 kg object is going to start sliding to the right as, as well. This one's acceleration at, at any given time would be equal to this one's acceleration. This one's velocity downwards would be at any point would be this one's horizontal velocity to the right as well. The, this one's displacement, this one's displacement would be also equal. Only this is going to experience all of those vectors in the horizontal alignment. This is going to experience all of those vectors in the vertical alignment. Why can we have this, mass, this mix up of these two different elements? because of the introduction of pulley. Pulley is such kind of a mechanical device which can change the direction of a force without changing its value. Frictionless pulley, that is. If you have a breaking pulley, then that's a different issue. So the point that you have to understand, if we have some force available to this combined mass system, that force will be responsible to accelerate both of these masses. If you have some energy available to this system, that that energy is available for both of these masses. That is the important key aspect that you should remember. And that's pretty much the point where students sometimes mess up this question. So I'm going to show you this calculation two different ways. Let's say if I go first for the energy con uh, consideration, 
have a look. This one kg object is going to fall by 0 0.50 meter. So when this object is falling down, it had a GP, initial GP, that is equals to MGH. I'm going to calculate this later. M is 1 kg, G is 9.81, and H is 0 0.50. As this object continues falling downwards, this object is also gonna start moving to the right. And when this one kg object is gonna hit right over here, it's gonna have some speed, and this is gonna also have some speed. Logically, they both will have the same amount of speed. So when this one kg object would have fallen by 0 0.50 meter, this initial GP would have been converted to the kinetic energy of 3.0 kg object. That is two kg plus one kg together. Because both of the objects would be sharing the GP that is delivered from the one kg object. The one kg object is not free falling. You have to understand that. It is falling downwards. So it is converting a portion of its GP into its own kinetic energy. And it is also pulling the two kg object to the right. So an, a certain fraction of its own GP will be also fed to this two kg object for its own kinetic energy. Interestingly, because they're counted by a string, at any point of time, their speed would be exactly the same. If you go for go ahead to uh, calculate this part, which is going to be pretty simple, I can simply write that 1.0 into 9.81 into 0 0.5 equals to half into 2.0 plus 1.0 v squared. Solve this question for uh, equation for v. You're going to get your answer. It's pretty simple. Half of bad, calculator like that. 10 into 9.81 divided by 3 root over answer. We got, I got 5.72. What did I mess up? I definitely messed up something. So, mass money is 1 kg. Yeah, GP is for 1 kg. So, you can 2 kg to pull it. Yes, but that, don't, that one doesn't have any energy. I cannot do this problem by energy consideration. Why? I'm supposed to be able to do this by energy consideration. There's no loss of energy over here. What am I missing here? That up. I can it. Sir, I got 1.8, sir. Okay, root over got the Hi, hi. Sir, root over got 10 into 9.81 divided by 3. I have 10 minutes and 1. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was losing my mind. 9.81 divided by 3 equals to something root over of answer equals to 1.8. Yes, got it. Thank you, thank you, kid. 1.80 meter per second. Yes, this is, a, this is a correct way to go for the problem. Perfectly all right. The second version is that we can go for the basic idea of mechanics where we apply for the force. You have to understand that the driving force of this whole moving system is going to be the weight of this one kg object, which is going to be mg. That force will be responsible to move two objects, two kg and one kg together. And the amount of movement that this is going to fall downwards is 0 0.50 meter. So what are we going to do? The resultant force working on the system is going to be the mg, where this m is actually the 1 kg object only, 1.0 kg. This resultant force is going to be responsible to move the whole system. So if I consider the total mass of the system, there is 2.0 plus 1.0 multiplied by the acceleration. This is a common acceleration of the whole system. That should be equals to 1 multiplied by 9.81. This equation is going to give you the actual acceleration of the whole system, which is not equal to 9.81 because one kg object is not free falling. As it is falling downwards, it is fully moving itself down and it's also pulling the two kg object to the right. So that weight of one kg object is responsible to move both the objects, two kg and one kg together. So from that point, you can get the acceleration of the system, which is going to be 9.81 divided by three. You get how much? 3.27 meter per second square. And then very basic uh, uh, kinematics equation follows. V square equals to u square plus twice a s. So therefore, V equals to root over of 0 square plus 2 into 3.27 into 0 0.50, which still gives you 
1.80 meter per second. So do you have a code bar? Whichever rings your bell. A question to do you have a courage abe? Karan, a question I want to conrocom energy loss of Sena. Bujaga Sagina. Important parts of say, but Bulkor location does say a can. Follow under Asia at the Bulta Corre. By Asia at the Bulta Corre. In this case, the total initial GP, which was only coming from the GP of the 1 kg object, was transferring to the kinetic energy of both the objects. Or in over here, the total amount of force that is available because of the weight of the 1 kg object is responsible to move both the objects. That's the key part that you shouldn't mess up. Yes, Hassan, go ahead. Sir, um, your 1 kg load, uh, the, the, like the system uh, below the pulley, that is the amount of loss of GPE. Yes. But the system uh, to the left of the pulley and the system below the baby, both of them code for the kinetic energy, which is equal to the amount of energy lost, a gravitational potential energy lost. Yes. Yes, sir. Uday. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, is okay, Sir, sir, I can answer up sir. This is equal to use for plus two as, sir. Open is up expression for the. I can take it. So that's that. Sir. Bala. Sir, second system at formula to give away a direct reference at a bujan muscle. Eta. G sir. The effective force, the other force that would be responsible to move both the objects combinedly, two kg and one kg at the same time, would come from the exclusive weight of the one kg object. Weight, art is pulling it down. Let's say for the time being, we are holding the object right over here with some support system or maybe with our hand. As we're gonna let the, I let our hand go, as we are gonna allow the one kg object to fall down, this is gonna start falling down. So the effective external force that you have by virtue of something is actually the weight of the one kg object. It are weight of the object take a heart to the right move for the center because along this surface, this motion is frictionless. राइट so that's why I wrote this thing that the resultant force available to the system is coming from the weight exclusively of the one kg object. That's why I wrote the resultant force. I wrote the equation, the total mass into resultant acceleration, MA. I wrote this expression for which is uh, force, and then MG comes from work here. And then, yes. All right. And then we have question number 45. Some people do this problem very difficult way. Some people do this very easily. Uh, I can tell you that this can be done very easily by a very simple method. Uh, 1.2 kg mass is supported by a person's hand with and two newton meters as shown. When the person's hand is removed, what is the initial vertical acceleration of the mass? Okay. So simply have a look. I'm saying that uh, there's a simple reason that why I'm choosing to solve this problem. You need to understand that uh, did say people wittingly or unwittingly chose this kind of weird angles 37 and 53. The answer is they wittingly said these two angles which where the values look pretty weird but lo and behold if you add these two numbers you get 90. Do you get 90? Yes sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so the vector sum of a 3 newton and a 4 newton force is actually 5 newton upwards. That's this three, four, five are basically Pythagorean uh, triplet. Do any of you know what Pythagorean triplets are? No, yes, yes. Sir. Integer numbers which produces this kind of ratios: so, a square plus b square equals to c square. So three, four, five is the first Pythagorean triplet. Then you have uh, then you have all the multiples of these three things. So for example, uh, four, six, ten is also a Pythagorean triplet. Then you have I think uh, another thing one at the nine. Uh, I think nineteen uh, nine nine the set. Let me just show you. Uh, 
Prism triplet is a pretty int uh, important uh, uh, mathematical concept that you should have as you reach up to your bachelor's level. I mean, if you go to some other university and people tell you Pythagorean triplet, right? And you say, what? And people are going to be like, you don't know? It's kind of not going to be a good thing. Oh, we got a list for that. Beautiful. So we have three, four, five. We have five, 12, 13, seven, 24, 25. So all of these three triplets actually mean that if you uh, square of square plus square equals to square. So they basically represent the three possible integer length sides of a right angle triangle. So this list can go on for a, for a pretty big, big values, but I actually knew some of those and then I forgot. I got me a IB admission test from my Shikhsilam, Kotogulam Hosto Kursilam, and I got a poor cash to for a gosh of blaze. So, anyway, the point that I was trying to make. Sir, hey, Bolo. Sir, boosters. Kotin me to hello, Kurbo Kuilo. A vertical components will be curvo, but a plus curvo. So it can match course to the cam if directly five minutes. The reason they chose these two numbers is because this question was aimed for a MCQ question. It could very well be possible, say people could have given number angles over here which would not add up to 90 degrees. But what I'm trying to show you is that just to have a little bit of foresight, if you just have a look over here, uh, some some of these two angles gives you 90 degree. So the resultant of this four newton force and this three newton force would be upward direction of five newton. And the weight of the object was 12 Newton. So if we move, remove the hand, these are the only forces that would be available to the system. Currently, the hand is also exerting an upward force of seven Newton to balance the object. But the moment we're gonna leave, leave, remove the hand, you're gonna have a five Newton upward force, you're gonna have a 12 Newton downward force. So, that, so there'll be a resultant seven Newton downward force and the total mass of the object is 1.2 kg. So seven Newton equals to 1.2 into acceleration. That basically much gives your initial acceleration. 7 divided by 1.2. That's one way to do this. different rectangle. Uh, angle value different. Simply, we have to do this. 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 We have For example, if I just go ahead and write, uh, it's going to be a bit. Uh, let me just use a longer arrow. Let's say 4 Newton A element component have a 4 cos 37. If you wonder why cost, because this is the adjacent component. Ediga hoito hoche four sine thirty seven, which I'm not bothered about. And a vertical sided angle hobe hoche, edika angle hobe a three newton angle hobe hoche, three cos fifty three. And you will see in your calculator if you just write these two values in your calculator and sum these two up, you're gonna get exactly five. Check this out. Sorry, three point two or one point eight. Sir, disconnected sir. I'm the disconnect So, and also you, you, you uh, because for the sake of uh, problem solving, it is also necessary that you should check the balance of the horizontal forces as well. Uh, just for the sake of completeness of the calculation, if you just calculate these two forces as well, let's say over here, we're gonna have for sine 37 and over here we're gonna have five sine 53 you calculate these two numbers and you're gonna see they are exactly equal numbers calculate them individually or you can put in a calculator four sine 37 minus five sine 53 that's is gonna give you zero proving that both of these numbers are exactly same which means this horizontal components of these two forces one over here one over here these two horizontal components are gonna balance each other out just fine so all that we have to do is to find out the total scenario of the acceleration using the vertical components and the available vertical forces, which goes on like that. What should I say? Yes, sir. All right. Sir. Bala. Sir, admission test, sir. Um, you go to the triplets. No, 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 no. I be admission test a on a show on a third material question. As to can a problem solving on a question, tacto estimation on a global on tacto, uh, inequalities problem tacto, permutation commission. They had a wide range of 
I'm talking about IBA admission, MBA admission test. Jeta ami disilo, ami BBA admission test di nai. So MBA admission test is on a wide range of mathematical problem thakto. So I was sort of a nerd. So I learned more than necessary. Let me just put it that way. No sir, I'm like sir, IIT test te chilo ani ki. Acha, hoy the bade. Plus, ami achhe cipher sa na class ni tam. So there are some small mathematical facts that. randomly presented to the class would mesmerize the students a little bit help me get good control on the class because when i was taking classes in cyphers i was literally junior to everyone in the class anyway not to brag but a little bit of bragging yeah. okay 3.2 aswad Yes, sir. Do you know what I'm saying? Sir, hello, sir. How are you? Hello. Tomorrow, I haven't been hearing you for a very long time. I mean, the last time I heard your voice, apart from this response, was when you uploaded your last uh, recorded song on Facebook. Sir, I haven't done a lot of things. I'm working on some things too, but yeah, it's okay. I mean, take your time. No, no rush there. I'm just wondering that if you're all right. I mean, I haven't yes, been. Yes, sir. I'm all right. Ask us fine. If you have any question, just let me know. Or if you have anything to talk to about, talk to me about. Just let me know as well. Be yourself. Yes, sir. Do your thing. Three point two. Uh, nine. 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 Write up these numbers. Nine, or I might actually write these numbers. Nine, ten, fourteen, seventeen, thirty-six. Hey, Paul, I'm going to try. Koro, I'm going to be right back. Nine, ten, fourteen, seventeen, thirty-six. Ask this one. Two A on the wall. The diagram shows the forces which act on the ladder. Which equation is formed by taking moments? Okay, this is a pretty simple problem, but it looks a bit uh, gruesome because of the way the examiners put the answers. Here's the deal: whenever we're dealing with unknown forces for a moment scenario. it is always the best choice hear me out whenever we are working with unknown value of forces for the case of a balance situation we are considering the moments it is always the best choice to consider the moments about a point through which most forces go through so that by default irrespective of the value of those forces the moment of those forces become zero for example If I want to do the the moment calculation of all of these forces individually, then we have F, W, and W. I can choose to consider the moments about this point. In that case, the moment of this force would be zero. I just have to consider the moment of these two forces. I can consider about this point where I have to consider all the three forces. I can consider all the four forces. To be honest, there is another force over here. I actually forgot. If I consider to choose the uh, moment calculation from this point, I can get rid of W in my equation. i can only have to deal with the other three forces however if i choose this point right over here i can get sir, rid of both of these forces yes oh it's sir apnar eta mouse ta dekha jacchilo na ekhon dekha jacche acha i'm sorry so if we take the moment about this point then we're going to have this both of these forces get out of our equation altogether that will bring up a very sweet situation that we only have to build up the uh, equation for these two forces which i'm going to do and then i'm going to show you how this equation in the uh, answer keys actually makes sense so if i take my moments about this point w force is going to produce a moment this is the w force and the perpendicular distance of the w force is a so we have an anti clockwise moment of w a in this direction we have a f into h clockwise moment over this direction so because the question says it is rests against a vertical wall rest in this case actually mean equilibrium so that would be moments should be balanced so that basically gives me wa equals to fh interestingly this is not available in any of this equation but if you have a good look 
option choice A pretty much means that same equation. You have two W on both sides. Change the side, take one out, you get this equation. So A in this case is the correct response. Now you might wonder why on earth did the examiner choose this as the correct option? Why? Because they chose to do the math using this point as the equilibrium point. If you wonder, how do I know? Because I tried multiple other options in the earlier batches and I know from experience. What is the equilibrium point? There is all, I mean, there is no equilibrium point over here. And sir, yeah. which one did they consider as the equilibrium point? That for, there, is, uh, there is no equilibrium, right. equilibrium point. I'm considering about pivot point. Did I use the term? If I am using, been sorry, using sorry, the term sorry. equilibrium point, I'm sorry. Uh, because the whole system is in equilibrium, you can choose any of the point to be your pivot point. And you can consider your moments about any of the points, considering your pivot points, and that the equation would just stand up just fine. So if you consider the moments produced about this point, which they considered, you're going to get this equation. If H produces a clockwise moment, WA produces an anti-clockwise moment, W into 2A produces an anti-clockwise moment. So we have two clockwise moments, FH and WA. So I'm going to write this thing, FH plus WA, which is coming from this and this, should be equals to W into 2A, which basically gives you this equation. So it's up to you, which point do you want to take the moments about? And ultimately, you'll get the same exact problem, same exact uh, answer. Uh, I'm going to go, always going to go for the for point that gives you the simplest of the calculation, which is basically the point through which multiple forces go through the cross point of most of the forces, unknown forces. That way, the moment of those forces are automatically obliterated from the equation because the perpendicular distances are zero. Yes, sir. So you go only time spent cooked. No, no, no. First no, no, no. thing Here's the deal. You get this equation, you find don't find this, then you try to simplify this equation. And you can have a look that these equations are not simplified altogether. This can be simplified into FH into 2WA. This equation can be simplified as 3WA equals to FH. This can be simplified as minus WA equals to 2FH. Simplify these equations and you're going to definitely get only the variables relevant FH and WA with some numer nu numerical values uh, uh, beside them. And then you can judge pretty easily. They did not simplify these expressions over here. That's why this answer choices look a bit Lumpy. So the pivot selection, which you have done, then what did you? Pivot selection. What did The choice of pivot selection is that if you can see within your figure that there is a definitive point through which multiple unknown forces pass through. If there is such a point, try to take moments about that point. That way, all the forces which go through that point will not appear on your moment equation. That's the basic idea. Just have a look at the figure, take some time and judge that which point is the most convenient to take moments about, or in other words, through which point most forces go through. It will take some time, but that would lead to a much simpler calculation further down the line. Bucho. Yes. Don't worry. I'm going to go for number 10. Sir, 10 answer key, sir. D, sir. I'm going to answer key. I'm going to Question number 10 is not actually difficult. There is a sequence of calculation that you have to do correctly to do the PEM problem uh, done. I'm going to help you understand this thing. <laughs> this is a very simplified problem, simpl simplified figure without showing you the necessary other adjustment that is that are in place for this whole problem to work. What this question is telling us that we have a spindle over here, which that spindle is essentially held stationary or by some mechanism. There might be some ball bearing, there might be some hinges or whatever. There is a disc over here, which has a radius of 0 0.20 meter. There is a pulley, which is converting the horizontal tension into vertical tension. And that value of this tension to or the value of this force pulling this direction is also 900 Newton coming from the weight of this load. So we want to hold this whole system in stationary condition by producing some couple, which are going to be produced by the two hands applying force over here and over here. So both of our hands, our left hand is going to, let's say, push on this end in that direction. And that is, that hand is going to pull in this direction by equal amount of forces. So they are parallel and equal force uh, oblique from each other. So they produce a couple. 
and that couple is going to be responsible to balance the moment that is going to be produced by this 900 Newton force at a perpendicular distance that is equal to the radius over here. So the available moment right on the disc is going to be 900 into 0 0.2 and you're going to be balancing by the couple produced by the torque produced by the couple which is f into 1.2 these two moments should be equal and that basically builds up your equation now solve for f you get the value sir i did not understand how we obtain this equation sir uh, we are trying to uh, convert the clockwise moment produced by the couple, which is available from the F, to be balanced by the anti-clockwise moment produced by the 900 Newton on the spindle, on the disc. I mean, shouldn't this, uh, the distances be same? Like, are, can we just consider like 0 0.2 meter? I mean, it's just connected to the disc, sir. Yes, we can only consider 0 0.2. You are not going to consider the diameter because if, if I try to draw the top view of this scenario, let's say this is your arm handle, okay? Here is the middle spindle and let's this is the disc you're seeing it from the top what this question is telling us that we're going to apply two forces let's say one in this direction one other in this direction and this tension raw what raw uh, uh, cord is going let's say in this way which is pulling over here by 900 newton so what is the perpendicular distance of this force from this center point this much right so the anti-clockwise moment that we are getting is 900 into 0 0.2, which is this way. And the clockwise moment will be coming from the couple altogether, which is F into 1.2. That basically gives us the two opposing moments which should balance each other out. What should I say? Yes, sir. But sir, one last question, sir. Well, why only one F? Why aren't we considering both of the Fs? Uh, we discussed this in the discussion of the uh, moment, uh, in the discussion of the couple for multiple different variations. Right on this page, this one. We consider for the halfway point, we consider for any of the working point, we considered for a point outside the bar. For all of those cases, the moment was always given by one of the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance between them. Have a look at this. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sure. Mm, then we had 14. 14 in Parso Shobai? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Car problem is 14. Eh? If not, we'll Sama move on. Sir. Problem is? Sign for any. I said that. I mean, no worries. 14 a bolts of chair. Uniform rod XY of weight 13.0 Newton is freely hinged to a wall at X. It is held horizontal by a force F acting from Y at an angle of 30 degree to the horizontal as shown. What is the value of F? Okay. We have a hinge over here. And F is working this way, 10 Newton is working this way. So the easiest way to solve this problem is to divide the forces into components. What is the value of F? Freely. And then turn them, solve them by with the concept of moments. That will both this hold up. The reaction force is gonna work this way. This is the direction of the reaction force, not the other, other arrow. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> I don't know how much this angle is. This, this is theta. These are reaction force R. So,
Sir, are perpendicular to the wall or pathana? No. Sir, are key contact force? Yeah, contact force. But the question is says that it is held horizontally. The whenever they say held, it means the whole system is in equilibrium of forces, which means all the three forces should pass through a single point. Right. Oh, right. Okay. 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 So they are only considering that F sine 30 equals to 10 by considering the moment equation. Oh, that works. Yeah, that works. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm, I'm dumb. Okay. Sir, um, both but you don't have the length. So how are we going to consider moment over here, sir? We can, I'll, I'll show you why. This set of equations that I've written over here are perfectly all right. But solving this set of equations for the value of f can prove to be pretty troublesome to some extent, maybe impossible as well, because here we have three variables, three unknowns, r, theta, and f, r, theta, and f. So we have three unknowns, but we have two equations. So practically, you cannot solve this. That's why I was, I, I was a bit stuck. So how can we actually uh, solve this problem? Comes to the rescue that if you have want to get rid of any force part of your equation, try to take moments about the point through which that force goes by. In this case, which is, can be this, this point. So if I want to take moments about this point, this hinge point, I can altogether get rid of R from my equation. So this is how it's gonna work. This is an uniform bar. The question says it is a uniform rod, which means if this much is L, this much should be how much? L by 2, right? Obviously. Now, you see, our a vertical component of value is F sin 30. So, our a vertical component is the moment generated by the clockwise, our weight is the clockwise moment generated which means I can write F sin 30 into L should be equals to 10.0 into L by 2. That is your moment equation. Altogether, getting rid of R because taking moments about a point through which R was going through. This very well be easily solved because L and L crosses out, so you don't have to find out that its value, irrespective of its value, it works out. You get 10 Newton. See what I mean? We don't know the value of L, but we don't we don't need that. F sine 30 equals to 10 na. F sine 30 into L. Sir, we have to modify process. L by 2 calculate. So, uh, uh, Hassan, maybe you are considering that this upward force equals to this downward force. If you are considering that, you are uh, actually wrong. Because if you are considering the case of the vertical force, you have to bring about the R sine theta within the equation. You cannot write yes, an equation like that. But you will say. Yes, sir. Well, I'm going to say that complicated to say among chemical soft course problem to say a set of equation take us but a set of equations soft for possible now because you have three unknowns two equations not gonna work but this process really helps out the pressure of 17 17 is actually pretty simple question uh, it looks big but it's a pretty simple question the only reason I actually uh, March 17, uh, because students in many cases don't read the question properly and get the wrong answer. Have a look. The diagram shows a solid cube of weight W on and sides of length L. It is suspended by a frictionless spindle that passes to the center of uh, of two opposite vertical faces. One of these faces is shaded. So it's a three-dimensional figure. There is a rod that is passing from one side to another side. The spindle is now removed and replaced at a distance L by 4 to the right to of its original position. When viewing from the shaded face, what is the torque of the couple that will now be needed to stop the cube from toppling? Try to understand. If we are providing the pivot axis through this point, the weight of the object is still going to work through this point, And you're going to have 
an anti clockwise moment of wl by 4 which should be anti clockwise which should be responsible to cause the cube object to to roll the question is not asking you what is the available moment of this of this cube the question is asking you what is the torque of couple that would be needed to stop the cube from toppling so we want to stop that motion so which means we have to apply opposite moment of what is available here that is the part that the students many times don't read carefully they just look at the figure and directly go ahead and uh, 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 write the answer that the available moment of the system is wl by 4 anti-clockwise but the question didn't ask you for what is the available mo moment of the system the question is asking what is the required moment to oppose the available moment simple question but question na parad jone bhool hoi o jone question da highlight kursi nothing else रड थ्रु दिस पजिशन सो दिस मास What is working this way? This is your pivot. So, how much moment do you have? W into L by four. Sir. In which direction? Sir, anti-clockwise, sir. Beautiful. So, the object will try to rotate because of this anti-clockwise moment. If you don't want to allow that rotation, what type of what do you need to apply to the object? W L by four clockwise. Yes, sir. That's it. The other question that I marked 36. was thirty-six. Yeah, thirty-six is actually not difficult. You just need to have a little bit of imagination to put into work. The trailer of a thirty uh, trailer of weight thirty weight thirty kilonewton is hitched to a cab at X, as shown in the diagram. What is the upward force exerted by the cab on the trailer at X? Bujho. इखाने अमादेर ए टू पोन तो होते कैब थार्टी The question is, what is the upward force exerted by the cab at the trailer X? Which means, if you want to keep the trailer in this position, there is a vertical downward force, so there should be another upward force right over here, so that the trailer remains stationary. So, how much should be that force? Now, what you cannot forget that this wheel is also on the ground, so there should be another force working on this trailer from this point vertically upwards as well, like that. अखन अमरा A force taken here, bother cutting that scene. So, which means we are going to take moment about this wheel, which is the rotating point of this trailer. I mean, what? I am going to take a shot at it. Essentially, our A plank taken here. Down the cable, right? Na trailer is a body task. Take the cab out. This trailer is going to fall down on the ground using this center point as my pivot. So, we are going to take moment about this point so that we don't have to bother about this reaction force of the ground. So let's say this force over here is F. So then you can simply apply the idea of moment to have equilibrium. We have to have equal moment. So 30 kilonewton multiplied by 10 should be equals to F into 20. That basically gives you F equals to 15 kilonewton. That's pretty much it. Once again, the point I'm trying to emphasize in this in this discussion is that you have to choose your pivot point in such a way so that you can eliminate the unknown conveniently. बुझा कैसे? Yes sir. Sir, अदम rear टक ये हमरे pivot धोते सी. Rear wheeler axle point टके. अच्छा. मिथिला का problem दिसो शेरा वोशी three point two question number six. We're gonna look at it. <coughs> the question says 
A force F is applied to a beam at a distance d from a pivot. The force acts at an angle theta to the line perpendicular to the beam. Which combination will cause the largest turning effect about the pivot? Which combination will cause the largest turning effect about the pivot? Okay, let's just write this formula. This is F. This is the pivot point. This is the perpendicular distance for the working point. So the vertical component <coughs> on this part along this alignment, this is going to be F cos theta. Take okay, now. And we can also have F sine theta over here, which I can write, but this is not going to produce any moment, F sine theta. The reason this is like this, because that theta was labeled here, not over here. So F cos theta is the force which produces the moment. So in this case, the moment would be given by F cos theta into D. The question says, which combination will cause the largest turning effect about the pivot? So M value is borrow with the high, F value borrow with the cos theta value borrow with the D value borrow with the so you need to need a f large d large now the question doesn't give us the cost theta over here they only give us theta now you have to judge that for an acute angle for an acute angle how does theta behaves with cost theta if you increase your theta value from zero degree all the way to 90 degree how does the value of cost theta changes it changes from one to zero cost curve Tigna Tamano say theta fellow a figure you know theta fellow to the com hobby, cost theta fellow to the bishop, ultimately on the moment of the bishop. So we want large F, large D, small theta. Which I guess, sir, much better make a new figure, sir, to our boom, sir. For the, for the maximum moment, we want all the three variables on the right side of this equation to be large. So we need bigger force, big perpendicular distance, and also cost theta should also be large. The way we can make the cost theta large is by making the theta small, because that's how cost theta behaves with theta within the range of an acute angle. Sir, distance large, like force here is the deal we are not considering these variables to be interdependent theta they are somehow dependent with each other we are just trying to figure out individually a variable we're not considering that how f and d is going to work out for a constant value of m that's not what we're trying to judge we're trying to judge that we want to get a pretty large value of m what needs to happen to these variables Judgment angle to calculate. Judy Amra Bolton for a constant moment, what has to happen between F and D? F shakes F borrow to the D Choto. There has to be inversely related. But that's not my point. For the question is asking us that which combination will cause largest turning effect? Butchaki will say F and D are not to be considered to be codependent in this scenario. Sir, answer is A, sir. In this case, answer would be large, large, small. P is the correct response. Oh, oh okay, so sorry, sir. <coughs> sorry, sir. Eating time to the active answer. Everyone monic map to a series of the normal answer. According to the what? It is very simple. Uh, have a look at the question to justify the required logics for a pair of force to be couple. Couple how do you know? We need to have parallel forces of equal magnitude working not in the same line. A logical like two parallel forces of equal magnitude not working in the same line, working in opposite direction. Irrespective of their working location. No. See the duty force value equal now. A is the correct response. Now, they are apparently working on two dissimilar positions or non symmetric positions on the object, which is perfectly all right. Absolutely all right. Where does two forces work on a body it does not define whether the two forces, two objects produce a couple or not. It all comes down to the point whether we have equal opposite forces, parallel forces working not in the same alignment. That's what consists a couple. Sir, what does same line means exactly, mean, sir? 
like this one straight line one force this way other force this way truly opposite to each other yes sir thank you no problem আচ্ছা